Hello, everybody. Welcome to my lecture slash overview for intermediate accounting. This is the 18th edition of Wiley, uh, their chapter 17 for revenue recognition. Uh, my disclaimer and copyright notice, the information and opinions in this presentation are those of the author only and not the author's employers or affiliated organizations, including but not limited to Irvine Valley College, the South Orange County Community College District, or California State University at Fullerton. The presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute any legal or accounting advice whatsoever. This video is meant to be a companion to the 18th edition of Intermediate Accounting by authors Don Kiso, Jerry Weingen, and Terry Warfield, copyright 2022 by Wiley. Uh, this presentation is copyright 20, 2008 to 2022 by Bennett Tchaikovsky. All rights are reserved. Any distribution is strictly prohibited. So I just finished my lecture for my uh, fall 2022 um, Intermediate Accounting class at Irvine Valley College, great group of uh, students. Um, and just this is the best time for me to kind of go and kind of give kind of a summary of my thoughts on this. Um, one of the things is I will not be using Wiley's prepared PowerPoint slides, rather by using sec.gov and looking at the financial statements of selected publicly traded companies, we can explore the topics and attempt to give better context to the questions that Wiley has created. Um, I would suggest watching this video prior to going through the problem walkthroughs that I've previously created. Um, and again, you want to be doing this, uh, the more you spend time studying now, the less you have to spend on the CPA exam. So first, let's talk about revenue recognition. So when you took a lower division financial accounting class, more than likely the way you learned it was, oh, it's real revenue is realized and reliable, once realized and realizable, and it's earned, we recognize it. But the reality is, is that FASB ASC, which stands for Financial Accounting Standards Board, Accounting Standards Codification. How did I learn that one? Well, I looked it up on Google. Perfect. So there's five steps, and these can be summarized as identifying the contracts with a customer. And, you know, the next one is identify the performance obligations, determining the transaction price, allocating the transaction price to the performance obligations, and then recognizing the revenue when the performance obligations are met. So what's the contract with the customer? Not every business is going to have a contract. And for example, when we look at Home Depot momentarily, what we're going to kind of learn is that, well, they, if a customer buys something, they may come back and return it. So they have to go through and do an estimate of that. So there's going to be nothing in writing. But as we look at these other parts over here, you know, we identify the contract. If there is in fact a contract, we have to say, well, what are, what are we supposed to deliver to the customer? Is it a house? Is it a car? Is it services? What is it? Determine the transaction price. Well, within that contract, there should be a price to how much the customer is going to be paying us. Then in total, then what we have to do is we have to allocate that transaction price to the performance obligations. And then lastly, you're going to go through and recognize revenues as those performance obligations are met. So the one thing I'm going to say about revenue is you need to be very, very careful because revenue has a lot of upside, but it has huge downsides. As a business, you should never be doing business just trying to get revenue. It has to make sense. Are we going to get paid? Am I do dealing with someone who is credit worthy? What type of customer are we doing business with? The thing I'm going to show you right now is I one of my very early jobs was at a CF. I was a CFO for a company called Digital Lava. And aside the place where I met my my wife, uh, my future wife, which was the best thing to ever come out of that company, as well as some of the friendships I made, um, I came in and it was a really weird situation because this gentleman right over here who happened to be the vice president of sales kept on coming into my office and he was acting really strangely. And so nice guy seemingly, but if you go through over here and look at this guy, you can find this on your own. Um, I came on board as CFO after in like early December, uh, 2000. So I was basically, uh, you know, I was basically became the interim CFO for digital lava 
and you can kind of go through and uh, take a look at this. I think I get mentioned that, um, let's see, am I mentioning this? Oh, here we go. On or about January 24th, 2001, Digital Office CFO discovered one of the contingent fire stream sales entered into by what? That's me. That's exciting. I mentioned a CFO. So there you go. Exciting, right? So, but again, as a CPA, you're going to get blamed for everything. So it's just simply not worth it. So again, when you're recognizing revenue, you want to recognize it if it makes sense, but you want to be very careful in terms of how you're doing it. If you are a brand new company and it's the first time you're doing business, do you want to be recognizing revenue immediately? Probably not because you don't have the experience in terms of returns and all those different types of things. If you're brand new and starting out as a business, just kind of think about it logically, it's not going to be worth it. So, and also too, when you're working as an auditor, remember that, you know, when you are, if you're working as an auditor, right? Remember, when we prepare financial statements, financial statements are the responsibility in the words of Roger Philip, the financial statements are management's responsibilities. Roger's CPA review. Auditors need to be independent. So when, if a company doesn't know how to recognize revenue, that's really on the company. As the auditor, you have to say, hey man, just prepare the stuff or show me what you want to recognize and then show me the supporting documentation. So, but as an auditor, we can't go in and tell management how we believe that they should be going through and recognizing revenue. Now, what we can do is we can tell the CFO or whoever it might be, say, well, there's other publicly traded companies that are out there. And if you go find them that are similar to yours, you can find some different things the way that they go through and recognize revenue. And so here are some companies we're going to go ahead and look at right now. So if you take a look at a company like Tesla, and so right over here, that's actually these are homes, hold on. So Tesla is right over here. So for Tesla, as we see this, this is for their quarterly report into June 30th, 2022. And if we come down over here, and what we're gonna notice is that they have this whole section over here by revenue, and again, this is the table that shows where are they getting all their revenue from. Automotive sales without resale value guarantee, automotive sales with a resale value guarantee, automotive regulatory credits, energy generation and storage sales services and others. Auto leasing, energy generation and storage leasing. So as you see over here, they'll basically talk about how do they go through and recognize revenue. All of them are mentioning this ASC 606 basically uh, from cause of sale with a right of return when we do not believe the customer has significant economic incentive to exercise the resale value guaranteed provided to them at contract inception. So again, they're going to talk about how they go through and recognize revenue. And I want to encourage you to find companies that you like and go through and read about how they recognize revenue. Um, and by the way, when you're starting at your full-time job, what I typically advise students to do when they're working at Deloitte or wherever it might be, or big four firm, or if you're going to be auditing publicly traded or privately held companies, look not only at your clients, 10Ks and 10Qs, but look at the ones for their competitors as well. So this is for the Home Depot, right? So the Home Depot, see over here, they've got deferred revenue. Well, why do they record deferred revenue? is because they haven't gone through and performed all the services. So this is an example of somebody who records, uh, basically this is deferred revenue. This is also gonna be when they're issuing out gift cards. The one over here, this is for Beezer Homes uh, USA. And again, I'll include these links below, uh, but for Beezer Homes USA, when we go through here and look at this revenue recognition, and this is where I copied it from my, from my presentation, is well, we recognize revenue upon the transfer of promised goods to our customers and an amount that reflects it. So this is what they're kind of going through and doing. They talk about their revenue and how they go through and they handle their home building revenue, right? How do they handle their land sales and other revenue? So again, every company is going to report revenue on their financial statement, but then they have to, in their footnotes, disclose, disclose more about how they're going through and actually recognizing it. So when we're looking at revenue, these, how they're going through and applying the principles is actually extremely important. 
because again, this is a very hot button issue with the Securities and Exchange Commission. The amount of revenue a company reports is typically going to drive a lot of different things. If net income is up, but revenue is down, it can be a sign that, well, is the business slowing or what's actually happening? So, um, and the, the, for this particular chapter over here, uh, when we're looking at intermediate accounting, like, so let's just kind of talk about like some of the different questions that you're going to be kind of going through here and seeing. So I've made videos on almost all like of these different ones over here, but in terms of when you're going through and about to tackle some of these questions and Wiley, let's talk about some of the main ones. Okay. So when you're, when you're dealing with long-term construction contracts or long-term contracts, there's really going to be two methodologies for recognizing revenue. There's percentage of completion. And then there's what used to be called the completed contract method or the cost recovery method. What's the difference? Cost recovery, you wait till the very end. You recognize no profits until the contract is complete. You always recognize losses on each one. And for percentage of completion, you're going to recognize profits as along the way based on the percentage it is complete. When you deal with percentage of completion um, calculations, which is by far uh, one of the juicier ones to go through and do, you want to take a couple of different steps as you're going through and doing these problems. So here's an example. First thing I'll go through and do is basically say, okay, what is my total for each year, right? They'll give you something like this. And I'll say basically, okay, what's the total contract profit or loss? Once I know if there's a profit, if I'm doing percentage completion, if my costs to date are here, estimated to complete, so I'm roughly about 20% of the way done. If I'm 20% of the way done, that's how much of the profit I can go through and recognize. However, if I'm going through over here and say, well, I, uh, for in year one, I was 45% complete, and now I'm 75% complete, what I have to kind of take into account is that, well, I can't recognize the profit twice. So make sure when you're going through and doing these types of questions, make a little chart for yourself and make sure that when you get to the end of the contract, if I've made X amount, that the amount I've recognized every year equals that total. It's a good way to go through and to check your work. So percentage completion, again, I have videos for these. You can find them on the, the basically the summaries for chapter 17 and chapter 18, 17, 18, 17th edition, 17th, 18th edition, chapter 17, 18th edition. The other question <clears throat> that I also go through and really kind of, the other one I like to explore is they have this great problem, 1712. And this is really relating to a franchise. And the reason why I like this question is that it's ambiguous. It opens up the discussion for really kind of talking about these concepts over here, right? Is basically saying, well, identify the contract with the customer. What are the performance obligations? Determine the transaction price. And the other thing I like about this particular question is that what it does is it has, well, there's a note receivable, but the note receivable is payable over several periods. So intertwined with a normal revenue recognition question, you get the whole thing about, oh, now we have like this note and some interest revenue coming through. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I love the exciting questions, right? But that's why I did my chapter five overview was like three long videos because it's like these are very important concepts, especially for accounting. So this, this is kind of like uh, the overview, the other parts of the other questions they have, uh, which I've selected in terms of going through and doing it, allocating to the transaction price. This is an actually, this is actually a pretty good question um, just in terms of like, oh, if the amount of the, the total, if the customer is paying 12, 2400, but the retail value is, then you have to kind of go through and allocate it out um, over here, you're again, it's an allocation of the transaction price. If you have sales returns, I don't really focus on that that much. 
um, allocating the transaction price and time value. Um, here's one warranty and customer loyalty programs, gift cards. And, you know, like, look, there's so much stuff in these questions and these chapters. There's just no way in teaching a normal class that I can go through and do it. So that's why I make these videos and have them in here. And so in class, I choose to really focus on the completed contract method, as well as going through and doing um, the, the regular, like the larger five-step type of process. Just give me one moment. And so this is, this is going back over here to basically to the CPA exam. When you look at the importance of revenue recognition, like right here in the very first module, you'll basically see, oh, basically going through over here and starts, oh, the five-step approach, right? Identify the contract with a customer, all these different things. So what you're going to be learning in over here is going to be directly applicable to when you start going through and basically in studying for the CPA exam. Um, if we look over here, um, recognizing percentage of completion method. Oh boy. Um, coming down over here, accounting under the percentage of completion. So all of these things that were kind of going in completed contract method, that's what I call it, but they call it cost recovery. So again, as you're going through and looking at these, I don't really focus on the journal entries in my class. I'm more interested in the gross profit of it. But again, that's this is what you're going to be really be going through and doing when you're when you're learning about rec revenue recognition uh, for the CPA exam. So you want to spend some time with this. So, but yeah, but again, like uh, this is again, I you know, I I would just tell you that the more time you spend now means the less time you're going to be spending later when you when it comes to preparing and studying for the CPA exam. But in any event. Um, I want to thank you for being with me here today. Um, if you have any questions about what I went through, feel free to ask me um, and feel free to email me at 1812cpa.gmail.com. And I look forward to seeing you on future videos. Have a great rest of your night.